alternative phonetic knowledge in this world. So um, for those of you who have attended other talks in this series, this is part of our 150th sesquicentennial lecture series called Indigenous and Black Experiences in Georgia. And um, we're very grateful to the sesquicentennial grant for allowing us to bring speakers, including Dr. Weaver here today. And we're hoping um, for today's talk, Dr. Weaver will present us with some alternatives to land acknowledgements. A lot of the lectures we've had so far have been focusing like with a laser point on land acknowledgements <laughs> as a strategy. So we're really appreciative that you're here to broaden the perspective. And um, so just to introduce some things about Dr. Weaver, um, he is the founding director of the INAS, and he's a professor of religion and adjunct professor of law at UGA. So he holds two doctorates, a JD from Columbia Law School of Columbia University, and a PhD from Union Theological Seminary in New York. And his work in Native American studies is highly interdisciplinary. So it focuses primarily, though, on three areas. So we have uh, religious traditions, literature, and law. And he's the author and editor of 15 books, including um, That People Might Live, Native American Literatures in Native American Community, and Other Worlds, American Indian Literature, Law, and Culture. So um, in 2007, Dr. Weaver won the B Medicine Award for Best Book in American Indian Studies from the Charles Red Center. And um, he also won, uh, was part of the Native American Literature Symposium for his book, American Indian Literary Nationalism. And in 2003, he won the WordCraft Award for Best Creative Nonfiction from the WordCraft Circle of Native American Writers for Other Worlds. And in 1989, he won the Portfolio Award for Excellence in Teaching Resources from the Journal Media and Methods for his book on CD-ROM, American Journey, the Native American Experience. So we're very grateful to all the experience that you bring here today to this talk. So please join me in welcoming. Other words. Oh, did I say other words? I have so sorry. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I know as someone who's brought a lot of speakers to campus over the years, the other terror I feel when someone steps up with absolutely no notes or paper. So I have to <laughs> uh, I remember not long after I came to UGA on a crisp autumn Saturday morning, getting a call from my friend and colleague, Irvin Garrison. Dr. Garrison pioneered non-invasive archeological techniques like ground penetrating radar and uh, electromagnetism and so forth, which allow archeologists to look below the surface of land and see what's there without disturbing it. Uh, actually, he applied the techniques of shallow geology to archeology. span And I always tease him that he invented those techniques so that Archaeologists wouldn't waste time looking where there was nothing to be found. And after the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, he became a rock star because he could show them where not to dig so they could avoid human remains. But he asked me to go on a road trip to Clemson with him. And we went and to the home of two Clemson professors. And on their land, they had a woodland period burial mound. They had gone to refinance their home, and the title company refused to give title insurance because the, the lawyers believed that NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, allowed Indians to take back land if human remains were found. Since then, I've encountered this three more times. I never encountered it before I moved to Georgia. Uh, it's not true. Uh, but think about it. it. It shows the power that Indians still hold in the American imaginary. It's the return of the repressed in its most basic form. Indians are taking back the land through the agency of the dead. Uh, and they finally got their title insurance, but I had to write a legal opinion saying, telling them exactly how NAGPRA worked. But I, I just mentioned that. It's about land and taking back land, but it's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about land acknowledgements and their limits and some alternatives, as you heard. Land acknowledgements have uh, become commonplace. When I was asked to deliver this talk, I had to tell those inviting me that I'm not a, generally a fan uh, of them. 
I understand the impulse and it is well-meaning, but I'm not a fan when the tribal nations referenced are geographically remote today, uh, which is most often the case. Uh, when, when the tribal nations or first nations are proximate, it's a different story. For instance, at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, they always begin with a land acknowledgement to the Musqueam. The Musqueam have a small reserve immediately adjacent to campus, and campus was their uh, tradition. Uh, what's the land <coughs> acknowledgement say? Ancestral, traditional, and unceded land of the Musqueam people. So I'm uh, in, in those cases, I'm a fan, but not as is the case here when the Muscogee Creeks and Cherokees and Uchis have been forcibly removed 800 or more miles away. Uh, <clears throat> the reason I'm not a fan is I think that it allows non-native audiences to feel remorse for the length of the land acknowledgement and then go home and shower it off and feel they've been somehow uh, gained absolution. Uh, the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer referred to cheap grace. And I think that land acknowledgements are too often a cheap reconciliation. Uh, the, uh, it, I feel the same way about apologies. You know, the United Methodist Church some years ago apologized for the Sand Creek Massacre because John Chivington, who led it, was a Methodist minister. Uh, my favorite apology in 1993, the United States Congress apologized to Native Hawaiians for the United States part in overthrowing the Hawaiian monarchy. It won't happen again. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, during the last dark days of apartheid in South Africa, uh, there was talk of the Afrikaners issuing an apology for apartheid. And Desmond Tutu, who was part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, said, if you steal my pen, what good does an apology do me if you keep my pen? And no one's talking about giving the pen back. Uh, this brings me to the land back movement. The land back movement is a native led movement uh, trying to get institutions and individuals to uh, deed back portions of land that have been taken from them in the past. It, uh, and many nations have bought land back. I'm not talking about that, but the United Nation of Wisconsin has bought back about 80% of its original. 65,000 acre uh, reservation. The Yurok of California purchased 80,000 acres in the past decade. The Klamath, I could go on and on and on. But land back is not, uh, and, and uh, then I also tell, it mentioned that in 2020, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States in a decision called McGirt versus Oklahoma ruled that the reservations of the so-called five civilized tribes in Oklahoma had never been legally terminated, making about 40% of the state, the Eastern 40% of the state, still Indian land. Uh, but land back is not any of that. The seeds of land back go back to 1980 and the case of United States versus Sioux Nation. In, 18, in 1868, after what's called Red Clouds War, the Sioux were given a reservation that is largely coextensive with the, what is today the state of South Dakota. It was known as the Great Sioux Reservation. But in 1876, after uh, Custer's defeat, they, it was broken up into much smaller reservations and much of the land was removed from their reservations, including the Black Hills their most sacred site. The Sioux then began 
more than a century of trying to get the Black Hills back through legal processes. And there were fits and starts, and I won't rehearse the whole history, although it is a fascinating one. Uh, but in 1980, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Black Hills had been illegally taken in violation of treaty and awarded the Sioux a hundred million dollars. And the Sioux said, we don't want a hundred million dollars. We want the Black Hills. And the Supreme Court had to say, well, we can't do that. hundred million dollars was deposited in the bank and with compound interest today, it is two billion dollars. And the Sioux have never taken it on principle. At the time, Bill Bradley, Senator from New Jersey, the NBA star and Hall of Fame, most of the Black Hills, most of the Black Hills are owned by the federal government, including insult to injury, Mount Rushmore is carved out of the Black Hills. But the bill uh, died in committee. But that was the seeds of the land back movement. Uh, and it was centered uh, originally in the Lakota and Dakota Sioux. Uh, the land back movement today, its main focus has been trying to get the Black Hills back. As I said, most, uh, the, most of the Black Hills are owned by the federal government and could, in theory, be given back. Most of the land in the Western United States is owned by the federal government. 95% of the state of Nevada is owned by the federal government. Uh, so there's a lot of room here uh, for possibilities. Uh, it has not been centered just on those things, though. UCLA deeded a portion of its land back to the Gabrielino uh, Tongva. Other uh, University of California schools have given back uh, um, or, uh, parcels of land to the tribes that inhabited uh, the land where their campuses are. And most recently, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the Law Enforcement Training Center, top city that's to be built uh, in or around Atlanta. I'm unclear on the geography. Uh, but Muscogee Nation has, uh, or at least members of the Muscogee Nation, have called uh, for the project not to be built and for the land that's to be built on to be deeded back to the Muscogee Nation. Uh, in fact, the Muscogee Nation just opened uh, an office in Macon, Georgia. Uh, I bet you didn't know that. I didn't know it until a couple of weeks ago uh, when I spoke at Middle Georgia and, and the person who was sent to open that office, the first person sent to open that office, was on a panel uh, with me. You may know that there has been a movement that has gained force to turn the Okmulgee National Historical Monument, uh, which is a mound site, Mississippian mound site uh, in Macon, to convert it from a National Historic Monument uh, to a full-fledged national park and to expand its boundaries. The Okmulgee, uh, what it does, and it, if you haven't been, you should go. It's a spectacular site up on a bluff. And Mound A there, meaning the tallest mound, is 55 feet tall. That's not the tallest mound in Georgia. The tallest mound is in Etowah, and it's 63 feet tall. But uh, the uh, but Okmulgee, which is a federal site, is better curated, A, and it's just a much more spectacular site. Um, but if and when it becomes a national park, there is already an agreement in place that with the National Park Service, uh, there's a co-management agreement with the Muscogee Nation, that they will help co-manage uh, that site. That's true of uh, New Echota, too, which is outside of Calhoun. That's the Cherokee capital here in Georgia. Oh, and as an aside, this is my friend Andy Denson, Andrew Denson, who's at Western Carolina University, wrote a wonderful book about the memorialization of Indians in the South during the Civil Rights era. 
That's when all the monuments to Indians were put up. It, it was a way of saying, pay no attention to what we're doing to black people. So you see how inclusive we are. We're memorializing our Indians who of course are no longer here. And that was the case with New Echota. New Echota was reconstructed by the state of Georgia uh, between, I think, 1957 and 1963. I think it opened in 1963. Uh, but the state of Georgia today has a co-management agreement for the New Echota site uh, with the Cherokee Nation and the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina. I know this because uh, so any use of park outside of the state park itself uh, has to be approved by those entities. I found this out about a decade ago when I was the historical advisor for a PBS documentary on the Trail of Tears on Cherokee removal. And I had to spend about 45 minutes to an hour on the phone with the head of the Eastern Band's uh, Institutional Review Board, they wanted to see, they had asked PBS for the script. PBS said they don't give out. They don't share scripts prior to their use. And so they referred them to me. And finally, they took no position. That was, uh, they, they would allow it to go forward, but they took no position. But there is there, uh, with those two, federally recognized Cherokee tribes, a co-management agreement for that site. And I think co-management's agreements are, in addition to land back, are another possibility that will allow um, one of the UC campuses just signed a, a co-management agreement, which will allow the tribe to supervise the landscaping and so forth that goes on to be in keeping with traditional knowledge and indigenous plants. Then there's Bears Ears in Utah. You may have remembered this from the news a few years back. It was created by President Obama as a National Historic Monument uh, in the last year of his administration. President Trump shrunk the boundaries. President Biden put them back. That's because uh, petroleum interests wanted and mining interests wanted extractive rights close to the ears. But uh, the US Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management have a co management agreement for Bears Ears uh, with five different Utah tribes that have claims to the ears. So that is, uh, those are two models that I think. Uh, are fruitful. Um, I would rather this be a conversation. You, you have been going through this process now for how long? Started last fall. So almost an academic year. And I, I'd be interested in your, in, well, A, your questions, but also B, hearing, you know, what you've heard, uh, and how your thinking has developed. So I will just stop. It's only been 20 minutes, but I'll, I'll stop there because I really want it to be more of a conversation. And I won't move because I'll be off camera. <laughs> I can move this way. Okay. okay. So you can come a little bit that way. I'll come back out from behind that thing now. Well, I guess but maybe I don't want to, if others have questions, please feel free to. But maybe since you just stopped at that point about co management. Um, you just missed it, Steve. <laughs> you didn't get to vote after all that. You didn't even get to vote. So oh, the vote just happened? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, co I mean, uh, co-management and what that might look like for universities. Um, I, I haven't heard about the UC system uh, doing some land back work, and I wondered how that happened, although I also can imagine how an example, how citing an example about California might be received um, in Georgia. And so I wonder. <laughs> well, of course, uh, like Georgia in one respect, California had done a pretty good job of ethnically cleansing the state. Uh, they tried, you know, during 
the gold rush days, there were, you know, hunting parties on Sundays uh, to hunt Indians. Although uh, there are now a number of federally recognized tribes, they're mostly small, but California itself now has, it goes back and forth with Oklahoma, depending on the census, for the highest native population uh, in the country. Uh, but yes, the example of California and Georgia would yeah, be problematic. But what in practice would, I mean, what would that look like, that kind of co-management either of um, a, of land that is already uh, owned by the university or mm -hmm. or uh, maybe university out, uh, advocating for other lands, like in the case of Dahlonega, you know, there's there are other lands in the area that maybe uh, sort of, mm -hmm. they could, I don't know. Anyway, how, how, what would that look like, that kind of co-management at the university? First of all, I think that it would, that's a question for the tribes involved. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Delania, that would be the Cherokee Nation. Uh, here, further south, you'd be talking about the Muscogee Creek. Um, so I think that the first step is uh, consultation. Uh, getting in touch with them. In, uh, in the case of the Muscogee Nation, perfect opportunity with this new office. They've just, they, they're just opening, and I'd be happy to put you in touch uh, with the woman there, give you her email, uh, uh, who is doing that. But consultation as to what form that will take uh, is really not for me to say. In the case of California, it has very much to do with allowing access, a form ceremony, uh, and then, as I said, say in the landscaping, using traditional ecological knowledge. I always think it's neat that tech, tech, uh, traditional ecological knowledge is tech for short, uh, T-E-K, but uh, and, the, and the landscaping and so forth. Uh, so those are the, the kinds of things. In the case of the Cherokee Nation for Dahlonega, if you were to contact them, I would uh, suggest contacting their uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer uh, as a starting point. Uh, you know, the three-term principal chief of the Cherokee Nation was a UGA alum, uh, Chad Smith, who went there as an undergrad in the 1970s. You know, all of the General Assembly's anti-Indian laws from 1828 and 1829, or 1829 and 1830, were only repealed in 1980 when someone realized they were still on the books. I mean, it was just embarrassing. And that included laws that Indians couldn't uh, serve on juries, they couldn't testify in court against a white man, and so forth. And Chad Smith likes to joke that when he went to the University of Georgia, he was ineligible to serve on juries <laughs> because he was Cherokee. Uh, but uh, I'd start with the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, TIPO for short, uh, and I can get you that information uh, as well. And you, and you should probably also contact uh, the TIPO at the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina. There's an interesting relationship between the two. I mean, North Carolina, is a remnant population who, because of circumstances of removal, were allowed to remain uh, by military order. So although they call it a reservation, uh, the Eastern Band, it's not technically a reservation. Legally, it's a dependent Indian community because reservations can only be set up in one of two ways, presidential order or act of Congress. And this was a military order at the time of removal that the thousand or so people who hadn't been rounded up could stay and they were given land to do that. Uh, that's one nucleus. The other nucleus is 
the Cherokee Nation signed treaties in 1817 and 1819, surrendering their lands in North Carolina. But there was a provision in both treaties that any Cherokee head of household who was willing to renounce his citizenship in the Cherokee Nation, take federal citizenship. And, and you, you know, until the Civil War amendments, state citizenship and federal citizenship were two different things. Um, and live according to the laws of North Carolina, could stay and would be given what was described in the document as a personal reservation of 640 acres, square mile, one section. And about 400 Cherokees signed up for reservations. Not all of them claimed them, but 400 signed up and some claimed them. And so that's the other nucleus of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Uh, interestingly, at the Treaty of New Echota, they negotiated that provision again. And Andrew Jackson, before he sent it to the Senate for ratification, personally took pen and ink and crossed that provision out. He was not going to allow anyone uh, to remain. So I don't know if that's helpful at all. I'll get you some information. If we yes, sir. A couple questions in the chat. Um, one of them. Oh, I'm uh, glad someone's watching it. Yes. Well, we have eight. 16 people watch. No, no, no. I mean, you're watching the chat. Oh, that's as well. Yes. Um, do you have any thoughts about universities? I know that you do have uh, about thought universities who read land acknowledgments at events, but then keep tribal land. Well, again, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm not a fan of them. Uh, it's just, it's too easy, right? I mean, you know, the other thing I mentioned, Nagra. UGA has 800 sets of human remains, uh, which is the University of California, Berkeley has 9,000 sets. Uh, the problem is, oh, well, and I should say that 250 of those remain sets. And my set of human remains, it doesn't have to be a full skeleton. It can be, you know, a jawbone or teeth or any portion. It's for an individual, right? Uh, about 250 of those belong to the university. The others belong to the U.S. Forest Service and the National Park Service who leave them at UGA. And the agreement they have reached is whatever happens to the human remains recovered at Etowah, these will be disposed of in the same way. Because like, and this is relevant, I think, for to, to, to this question. Uh, the reason those haven't been given back is under the regulations under NAGPRA, remains have to be culturally identifiable, affiliated. And UGA itself was culpable that that uh, generation of scholars is aged out now by saying if they're prehistoric, meaning before the coming of whites, they're not culturally affiliatable. But we know. We, we knew then, and we know even more now, that here in this area, the Mississippians, and these are all Mississippian remains, uh, were the ancestors of the Muscogean peoples. We know that, you know? Uh, but, I mean, the Cherokees, they don't like me saying it. Some don't like me saying it. Are relatively newcomers into the Southeast. They reach the Southeast about the year 1200. And at, by then the Mississippian revolution was in full flower. The Cherokees themselves did not build mounds. They occupied abandoned Mississippian mound sites uh, because highly adaptive peoples, anything that has power and these mounds clearly were places of power. Uh, there is some evidence also that the Cherokee entered into a vassal type of arrangement with Etowah in order to be able to settle uh, here. So, uh, you, I'll, I'll, I'll finish the thought. There is, there is in the oral tradition, a story of the Anikotani. The Anikotani were Cherokee priests, a priestly caste class. And the Cherokee, according to this, were a theocracy. 
but that priesthood controlled everything. And then sometime around first white contact, something happened. It's usually assumed to be a drought that the Anikutani could not break. They became abusive of their power until the people couldn't stand it. And they rose up against the Anikutani and killed them all and overthrew the priestly caste. I don't believe they ever existed. Minority position. Because the Anikatani look an awful lot like Mississippian priests. And I think that's a mythologized memory of the Cherokee overthrowing Mississippian power over them. And the timing would be about right. First white contact, 1540. Cherokee had occupied Etowah, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> More in the chat or anybody? Yeah, there's another one in the chat. Uh, one of the common pushbacks against land acknowledgments is that they could give tribes a legal claim to file lawsuits to physically take back land. How does land back movement deal with this issue? Is there a legal framework these arrangements these arrangements to use to counter their art? No, and this really depends upon people of goodwill. I mean, if there were lawsuits to be brought, they would have been brought. <laughs> and and, and acknowledge, acknowledging the fact that you live on land that was taken from a particular tribal people, tribal nation, it gives them no more legal right than they have beforehand. You know, um, uh, it's like federally recognized tribes, and there are 574 at last count, I think, are separate sovereigns within the federal system. States have no authority over them except what Congress delegates to the states. And they are obviously loath to do that. There are also uh, two, four, four to six state recognized tribes in Georgia. State recognition means nothing. I mean, it gives them no more rights uh, than individual citizens. Now, there is a, a India, Georgia Indian Commission under the governor's office that has been set up. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, that deals with Indian issues in um, in the state. I was on it for a number of years, uh, and it advises the legislature and the governor with regard to Indian issues. So that's another entity that you might get in touch with. And again, I can point you in the right direction. But it's really made up of primarily of people from these state recognized tribes. You know, speaking of land back, under the, the second Bush administration, tribes could only open gaming facilities, tribal nations could only open gaming facilities within a commuting distance of their reservations. That was changed under the Obama administration. To, it simply had had to be agreeable to the community. And all five tribes to varying degrees have looked at opening gaming facilities back in their traditional homelands. The Cherokee Nation, in fact, just bought uh, the casino in Tunica, Mississippi, uh, which is not in their traditional homelands, but it was what was available. But uh, so the Cherokee Nation was looking, and, and the Muscogee Nation were looking at the possibility of gaming facilities here in Georgia. This is now a decade ago. And a bill was introduced into the General Assembly saying the governor could not sign a compact with the tribes, an agreement, unless 75% of the General Assembly voted yes. Only in the case of Indian tribes was this the case. This ended up with me on the phone with David Ralston, the, then the uh, Speaker of the Georgia House, explaining how the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act worked. I said, first of all, you're required to negotiate in good faith. Ultimately, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, if the parties cannot agree, can impose a compact on the parties but it's loath to do that absent a showing of bad faith. And I can't think of a more manifest showing of bad faith 
than requiring 75% of the state legislature to agree. And it went nowhere. But those are, some, again, some of the obstacles. But it, but, but it, it, it uh, doesn't give any more legal right than they have now. Long-winded answer. Another question, but I want to, I don't, I'm just, I want to make sure if you have a question in the audience. Um, I wondered, you mentioned apologies and uh, thinking about, you know, an apology next to an acknowledgement. How are those two things similar and how are they different? And, I, and I'm also asking, asking this question oh, with the, like some of the other, uh, Valences of the of apology. So, like, it, you'll forgive my limited knowledge of this, but I know that there was a time when, if you got in a car accident and you got out of your car and said, "Oh, I'm so sorry," that could be held against you, right? And that, that, that's true. That is under the law. There are certain exceptions to the hearsay rule. One is excited utterance said in the moment, like that, or an admission against interest. Uh, somebody jumps out of the car and says, "I'm sorry, it was all my fault." Why would the person say it if it weren't true? So it's admissible in a, in a court of law. So, so what I'm asking, I guess there's that there's that notion that has legal, like an apology may have legal ramifications, which is often mentioned as a as an objection to any kind of whether it's land, uh, like a land acknowledgement or even something greater, right? But also there's been a lot of discussion of the value of apologies. Um, as not necessarily a, like a conscious clearing sort of gesture, but as an opening for conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and many communities who are who have been historically marginalized in one way or another fall on different sides of that. Some advocate for it, and some see it as um, well, you, you, having. You, you may remember there was a move many years ago now uh, to have a formal apology over slavery. In this state, I feel like and, that comes up over and over. And, and, and I know yeah. land or labor acknowledgements is mm -hmm. part of what you're looking at. And the state legislature and UGA said they wouldn't apologize unless it were found out a that the state itself owns slaves, or that slave labor had been used to build the University of Georgia. We found out both those things <laughs> were, were true, right? And still nothing happened. For me. Um, as I said, apologies and uh, land acknowledgments, I kind of see as a piece, but an apology as a way of opening the conversation uh, with the people being apologized to. Uh, I'm in favor of that, but you know, it's otherwise it's just words. Uh, but if, it, if it doesn't issue in any kind of action, which again will begin by taking the form of a conversation. Yeah, I think there's uh, one. Some of the things I've been hearing and reading about is that this kind of apology is a never in, like there's there's nothing sufficient about that kind of apology, and and it, that it's offered and maybe even accepted with with that kind of understanding. Like, this well, is not let me. Enough. Let this me, is the, this is a. My uh, wife and I. Uh, a number of years ago, wrote a book on Cherokee removal. And we wrote it because I would ask my UGA students, probably very similar here, how many went to college, high school in Georgia? And about 75% of the hands would go up. And I say, what did you learn about Indian removal, Cherokee removal? And it always came down to four things. John Ross, Cherokee principal chief, good. Andrew Jackson, bad. It was cold. A lot of people died. I see you smiling. Did you go to a Georgia high school? Is that right? <laughs> well, the story is much more complex than that. And the Indians had agency in the uh, in, in what went on. But when I before we wrote this book and used it, and by the way, it's a part of a series called Reacting to the Past. It uses interactive role-playing games to teach about moments in history. Before, when I used to just teach about removal, and I don't think anger and guilt are effective pedagogically. So I always tried to avoid that. But I would be talking and some young man, it was always a young man, 
would raise his hand and say, that was a long time ago, and I had nothing to do with it. And I would say, you're right, it was a long time ago, and you personally had nothing to do with it. But let me ask you this. Your family been in Georgia a long time? Yeah, generations. And, and where do you live? Uh -huh. Same place all that time? I said, okay, do you know how your ancestors got that land? There was a lottery, and two bins were set up. And in this bin was a parcel of land description. And the name of your ancestor was in the other one. And they just put, pulled them out and matched them. So you had nothing to do with it, but you're still economically benefiting from it. And they can understand that. Right? Uh, students can understand that. So that's the same with the institutions. If you're on Indian land, you're still, the institution is still economically benefiting from that removal. Does that make sense? You got anything? <laughs> oh, Steve, Steve's got something. He has a unique freedom in not having heard the talk. It's like my students who haven't read the text, they have a unique freedom to comment. Well, I was wondering when Melissa was talking about the apologies, mm -hmm. it made me sort of wonder who, does it matter who says the apology? Because like the English department could get up in the event and give a land acknowledgement statement, but that's certainly not gonna have any sort of- But not the administration. Yes, it, what power does the university have if they do make an acknowledgement? Does it have any kind of binding power uh, politically or legally? You know, the, the regents might fear it does. That's always the danger, right? I mean, just politically. It doesn't, but, you know, I, I, in my talk, I talked about people who thought that finding human remains on land allowed the Indians to take back the land. This came up, UGA, there's a mound site called the Singer Moy Mounds down by Columbus that were owned by the Columbus Museum. And about a decade ago, the Columbus Museum had not been able to do anything with them, curate them properly or anything. So they wanted to deed them to UGA. And that required approval of the Board of Regents. And a member of the Board of Regents believed that NAGPRA allowed you to take land back. So again, I had to write a legal opinion to the Board of Regents saying that's not how NAGPRA works. You know, so the Regents might think it does. It, it really doesn't. But, you know, the question is, if your university president or university council issued such an apology and asked for conversation and the regions got wind of it, you know, I don't know what would happen. Uh, so, I, I mean, that's, that's, it's a good question, but it's an imp kind of imponderable. Well, it seems like people in the, in the chat are worried that it opens up doors for, for bigger things. Yeah. If we can show that it really doesn't have a whole lot of Force for yeah, especially not affecting the, the government. But even the government, who would have the power? Does the governor's office have the you know, power if they make this kind of statement? Or the governor's office statement? should have should have the power to make that statement. The general assembly should have the power to make that statement. But again, I said they weren't going to apologize for slavery. <laughs> so if you're not apologizing for slavery, you're certainly not going to apologize for Indian removal. Is there any power at the county level, or does it have to be a statewide? Counties only exist as emanations of the state, okay. so it wouldn't have any effect. Uh, I wondered if you could speak to the involvement of students um, in, uh, you know, in supporting land back movements or university measures or institutional measures to towards reconciliation um, or repatriation. I think when I think of the history of say, like, you know, the birth of ethnic studies, mm -hmm. um, black studies, that sort of thing, it really was student driven. Was student -driven. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, in, in a, for, a, for a university in Oklahoma or perhaps out West mm -hmm. where there is, as you pointed out, much larger, much larger native populations that are often driving that. There may be, you know, so right. I just wondered what your perspective was or experience was in working with students. Yeah, I mean, UGA has a relatively small number of Native American students. 
they only recently have a Native American student association, uh, and it is smaller than a smaller subset yet of the total Native student population. But at least they've gotten it up and going and kept it going for a little while now. Um, you know, I was hired at UGA and Steve, you know this, uh, by an associate dean who thought with Georgia's history, it was shameful, A, they did not have Native American studies. Uh, it was Hugh Ruppersburg. Uh, and B, he wanted to confuse this binary that race in the South is an issue of black and white. Uh, so that was administration driven, but you know, Student activism on this issue doesn't have to be solely the purview of Native students. I mean, you know, Native American studies itself and a lot of Native American issues, except in some states in the West, particularly, Native populations are, are minuscule in the, in the states. Um, and they would never get anywhere without the advocacy of well-meaning non-natives. So. so my experience has been, and Steve probably can speak to this more, but you know, students are very in when they're exposed to, say, Native American literature in my survey courses, they're 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 very interested in learning about it. And there's a lot to to kind of you nodding your head, there's a lot that's they feel is missing from their their K-12 education around these issues and the history of the places that they inhabit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there is some interest. I don't know, Steve, maybe with, as, a, as someone who teaches courses in Native American literature, you probably know more, you can speak more to this issue. Um, but we are at a university that doesn't have any, I mean, we. This is in the English department. We don't have a Black Studies program. We don't have a Native American Studies program, you know, any kind of focus in that way, although there's been some talk perhaps of moving, making movement in that direction, which is something that's excited the, the group that's working on this. So, um, so I don't know. It's like, it's, it feels a little chicken and egg in a way. It's mm -hmm. like when the students are interested, but you've got to have the infrastructure it almost seems like here. To bring it, and Kyle, probably you know, uh, you can speak to this as well. Um, in MSA, you know, what has been your experience? So how how does one raise the interest when there's not the infrastructure in place to give students the opportunity, especially at an institution again that doesn't have necessarily a large percentage of students who identify as Native American? Mm -hmm. Well, one way is through speakers like this, and you know or Native American writers and you know, so forth and so on. I mean, it's, it's obviously the largest institution in the system, but Kennesaw State, you know, has moved in that direction. Uh, of some kind of ethnic studies or uh, Native American studies. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get something ethnic studies related. And so I was talking with Brian uh, Dawson. He's like, oh, he goes up this real classes. It seems like history has Native history American has classes. Them. They have a couple of classes that aren't African American history, they're more like Civil War, like they're American history that might be about Black mm -hmm. issues, but it's not named that. And sociology has the Latino. So it's, they're really kind of spread out. It's yeah. like we don't really have a very consistent sense of focusing on ethnic diversity. And in the schools that I found in UJ being one of them, it seems like the universities, uh, at least here in the South, are really more interested in global diversity, getting the global population in and celebrating that and downplaying the sort of domestic diversity issues. Part of that is economic. I yeah. heard that by 2025, the, the number of 18 year olds begin to demographically crash. Yeah. And so global diversity is one way to keep your enrollments uh, and they're not they're not getting lots of scholarships, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 they're full pay, yeah. of course. Uh, well, when I came to UGA twenty two years ago, it took me two years, but I just began because there were classes in anthropology, 
There were classes in history. There were classes in English. I came to the religion department, meeting with the people who taught those classes. Yeah. Uh, and I began to have brown bags at lunch like this, where they could present their work, what they do, to their fellow faculty and grad students. Uh, and, and they kind of came together cohesively because they said, oh, th there is stuff going on here, you know? So I, that's why I suggested to Kennesaw State. You might try that. Yeah, that, that was definitely something we talked about. Even just having, I don't know, that wouldn't hopefully cost us more than a website mm -hmm. <laughs> to have it just in one place to say these are all the courses that are offered at UNG. Well, and I suggested to the diversity council, which I've heard nothing about in the 10 years that I've been here, but having someplace where we can even have students present their research on ethnic topics, you know, right. even once a semester or something like that, and, and trying to get, like you were saying, the infrastructure to get the students, yeah. give them a place to show up what they're doing. Well, and, and, and get them involved, yeah. Yes. So that, that's another good thing. When I got here, we had the American Student Club on this campus, and I had one member. <laughs> and then when he left, it just fell apart. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at UGA, 10 to a dozen are active in the organization. And UGA itself probably only has 40 or 50. Well, I wonder you know, about... I was, I was going to say, do you know how they got started? Were they all in the institute, or were they... Uh, they, it grew out of the Institute. I was their faculty advisor. An attempt had been made before by the uh, uh, Associate Provost for Diversity, and that went nowhere. When I came, UGA didn't even track its Native American students. Admissions didn't track it. Uh, so, you know, a few people got together uh, and put out a public notice of a meeting, you know, and as I say, they've got about a dozen uh, active. They do movie nights once a month, you know, pizza and movie, uh, and they put together some other uh, events. There was just one they, they put together on Native American music. Probably, well, I don't know if there's another class in this room. Do we need to? Yeah. So, do we have any final questions? Any anything left in chat? Okay. Well, thank you, and, and feel free to be in touch, and I will get you some more information on those three people. Thank you.